Hello and welcome to the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Uh, today's we have again some very fascinating re readings uh, for our reflection. I'm reminded before we begin to look at today's readings uh, of uh, the traditions back home in, in Africa. Um, uh, the, the church in Africa is could be characterized as one full of processions, dances, and themes. Um, I remember growing up, the month of uh, May was uh, when we did the, uh, the the crowning of Mary, and we take the statue around the village, you know, uh, before we put a crown or. or, or on, on the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, the month of November that is coming up uh, was usually characterized by uh, remembering those who have gone before us, and we would do that here at Rabuni. But in a very uh, big way back home, uh, we really, really focus on, on that, uh, sh showing the connection between the church triumphant, those who have gone before us, and the church militant. The month of October what I remember of the month of October was either it was the month of the Rosary or the month of Mary. I, I do remember in October we would go to church early to say the Rosary. And during Mass we would sing the Marian songs, you know, Immaculate Mary, the praises we We sang, I mean, the whole month was infused with this Marian theme. And uh, I want to take a page from that and go to one of my favorite passages in the Gospels uh, concerning Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, it is found in the Gospel of John. Uh, Mary is invited to a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and she invites Jesus as well. And Jesus also brings we along with him uh, his buddies, his, uh, his disciples. Uh, when they're at the wedding, they run out of wine. And um, I don't know why this is an issue that Mary thinks Jesus should solve. Uh, they should fall on the bride or the groom's uh, family. But anyway, uh, one can only suspect what happened, right, with the group of the disciples going to that wedding uh, who drank the wine. So Mary walks over to Jesus and says, they have run out of wine, looking at his bodies, probably, your disciples have drunk the wine. Do something about it. And Jesus, very rudely, I should say, uh, at least the way it comes out across, he says, Woman, this is none of my concern. My hour has not yet come. Uh, if, he, if that was mama, Jesus would have received a slap on his face, right? Uh, and then Mary does it, all, all Mary does is absolutely ignore everything that Jesus said. Looks at the attendants and says, do whatever he tells you. She looks at him and says, we're going to talk about this at home. And she walks away. I, I like that passage. Oh, by the way, by the way, did you know that if we only had the Gospel of John, we would not know the name of his mother? Because in the Gospel of John, she is never mentioned. She's always referred to as the mother of the Lord or his mother. Uh, but anyway, back to that wonderful line, do whatever he tells you to do. Um, what, what the Blessed Virgin Mary invites us to reflect on is being obedient to the word of God. And when we are obedient to the word of God, along the way, we can find healing, we can find fulfillment, our thirsts could be quenched. And so there is that strong move from the Blessed Virgin Mary of being obedient to the word. And sometimes being obedient to that word in the moment might not seem to make sense. We can ask ourselves, what has this got to do with my healing? But always have that gentle voice for Mary. Do whatever he tells you to do. I'm sure when those attendants were filling the buckets uh, with water, they were like, oh, this is a sheer waste of time. And they complained maybe along the way, but they did what he asked of them, and, um, and, and he turned the water into wine. We know the story. Um, let's go with that theme, do whatever he tells you to do. Let's, with that theme at the back of our mind, we go to the first reading. It's a very fascinating reading uh, from the Book of Kings. I invite you to go and read it. It happens in the ninth century, right? Um, and um, Naaman is the general of the Syrian army. He has within his camp uh, 
a slave girl from Israel, probably one that he brought home from uh, uh, after attacking Israel. Um, and Naaman has uh, a condition that is making life at home quite miserable. He has this skin uh, disease, uh, they call it leprosy. Uh, but um, this little girl sees just how Naaman is suffering at home, how this condition is beginning to break his spirit and break his family. So the little girl sums up the courage, goes up to his wife and says, you know, we have a prophet in Israel. If the general would just humble himself, swallow his pride, and go to Israel, he could be healed of this. Of course, Naaman, we can just imagine, our minds can play here, right? He just throw, goes into a fury, says, we have prophets here. In fact, I don't even worship the God of Israel. Why in God's name would I go to, uh, to Israel? I don't even worship their God. I don't even recognize that God. But you know, uh, what does he have to lose at this point? His condition is getting worse. So he goes to Israel. Uh, actually, the king of Syria contacts the king of uh, Israel and says, hey, I'm sending Naaman to you, you heal him. <laughs> and the king of Israel says, well, this guy just wants to pick a fight. He just wants to attack us again. Elisha, the prophet, hears about this and he calls for Naaman, the general, to come to him. Um, so Naaman goes over to Elisha's house. Elisha doesn't even meet with Naaman, doesn't even pray over Naaman. Elisha leaves a servant who instructs the general to go and take a bath seven times. Of course, we know that that infuriated the general again. And again, people around him plead with him and say to him, just do it. So he goes one time. I don't know if it is one after another, maybe it is once a week for seven weeks, maybe it's once a month for seven months, maybe it is once a year for seven years, we don't know, but he followed the process. What do I mean, what does, how does this, this preach to us, uh, uh, for us? I remember years ago when I just came from Africa, I was having nightmares. And uh, I went to see a counselor about having these nightmares. I just felt like something was crawling in my bed. It was a terrible, terrible time. Uh, and he had me do some exercises of uh, writing letters home, um, imagining, imagining myself being home. And I was ask myself, what has this got to do with my nightmares? And he said, it is part of the healing process. You are here but your soul, your spirit is still in Africa. And there's a sense of uh, displacement there. So when you do these little exercises, everything will arrive here in the United States and you will be whole. Oftentimes, you and I look for answers to the problem now. We look at what we have, what we are struggling with, and we want to heal what we are struggling with. Could it be sometimes that the issue that I'm facing today is only but a symptom, and the healing has to go back seven years ago. The healing has to go deep down, and if we heal what is broken deep down, the symptom of that, what shows up today as, according to the scriptures, right, uh, Naaman's skin condition, it, it is a symptom. In the charismatic renewal, we used to do this, the healing of the memories. So I don't know what, uh, uh, what you are facing, some things that you are struggling with. Uh, uh, it could it be uh, some uh, ailment that you are facing today? But could it be that to heal what is happening today, you need to do things that maybe are not even associated with the issue today? There is a healing that has to take place at a deeper level. Remember the words of the Blessed Mother. Do whatever he tells you. So what is the Lord telling you uh, today? What things do you have to do that you say to yourself, this just doesn't make any sense, I want immediate answers. Could it be practicing forgiveness? Oh, I have back pain. Oh, my, my back hurts all the time. I feel like a pressure. Maybe we look at forgiving somebody. 
Uh, there are so many things that are just related where the core issue is not the symptom that we look at today. So I find that very, very interesting and this is where my, my thoughts are going uh, with this healing of Naaman, uh, which is also very interesting and I'll talk about it later when I go talk the gospel. Actually, let's go to the gospel. Uh, this gospel passage is usually used as a gospel of thanksgiving. I use it as a gospel of empowerment. Uh, these 10 lepers walk up to Jesus they have had a miserable life. They stand at a distance, at least this is how it plays out in my mind. And they ring a bell, say, clean, unclean, unclean. And they say to Jesus, from a distance, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And the scriptures simply tell us, he told them, turn around, go show yourself to the priest. In my mind, the way it plays out is, Jesus closes the distance. He walks towards them. He talks with them. And then he says, go show yourself to the priest. On their way back to the priest. And remember, he doesn't even say praise over them. On their way back, uh, they get healed. And one of them stops and uh, says, I'd rather go back and give thanks. And this person was a Samaritan. A lot of things happening in this gospel passage. The first is, uh, this guy who stopped and turned back to Jesus, he has a lot to teach us. And I'll just mention one, in the interest of time, why would you go seek approval from people who make you feel sick? I think that is what happen, is happening with this, this leper. He stops in his tracks and says, yes, I can go to the priests and the priest will tell me that I'm okay. But why would I give them that much power? I feel it in my bones that I am healed. In fact, I'm going to turn around and go to the person who closed the distance, who approached me even when I was broken, and I will give thanks to that person. So the, the first push that I feel is for, for a person like me who is uh, a misfit, uh, who is a people pleaser, we need to stop looking for approval, affirmation from somebody else. We already have it in God. That's all we need, because with the priests and the Levites, there's always going to be something else. Or you approach not wearing the right clothes, or you approach not speaking the right language, or what happened to his hair, or her hair. There's always going to be something else. They always find something. So, number one, stop giving approval, stop giving power to people who have already passed judgment on you. <laughs> they will only pass more judgment. The second thing that I find, and I'm going to close with this, is Jesus doesn't, doesn't even ask this Samaritan to convert. He says, your faith has made you whole. What faith? Samaritan faith. Oh, Lord have mercy. Can you imagine uh, somebody saying to, I don't know, uh, uh, a non-Christian, your faith has saved you. Over and over again, Jesus is demonstrating that the God that he serves knows no boundaries. He doesn't see whether one is Buddhist, one is Hindu, one is Christian. If there is a need, this God reaches out in that person's faith. No need for conversion. <laughs> what does that do to the evangelization? I remember when I was going into the desert, in the Kalahari Desert, my novice master said this to me, and I always remember it. He says to me, Brother Robert, he saw how enthusiastic I was to go to the desert. He says, Brother Robert, remember one thing, because I was going to go to the desert to convert those bush people, right? He said to me, Brother Robert, remember one thing. Before you get there, God is already there. Record. Maybe it's an invitation for us to step back a little bit and kiss the ground of the person that you and I are in contact with because God is already there. Jesus over and over again shows the people that these Samaritans whom they have been, who have been judged and, uh, uh, and found uh, wanting reveals something of God that the Jewish people don't have. The Samaritan woman, uh, the good Samaritan, this poor Samaritan who comes back, the Samaritan lady at the well, they all reveal something beautiful. Um, continue to pray with these scriptures, and I'm sure they will just come alive for you. God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.